going to get started uh, so that we can kind of keep it moving and, and make sure that we get through the content um, for today. So, welcome. Welcome to Start Your Success. Um, my name is Kim Carter, and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Brittany Goodson. Um, you may be able to find her if you look through the participants there. Uh, we both work as academic advisors and coaches for the academic success. You can see our contact information there. Um, if you're interested in anything here today on the presentation, you want to follow up on that or ask any questions. Other folks kind of hop on. Um, so if you are joining us, again, it's a recorded presentation. Your comfort level as to whether or not you want your video on, but do, uh, do keep yourself muted if you would. So, big piece of why you're here is to talk about um, this transition to college. Um, making this transition from high school to college it's going to be fairly different um, a lot of people will say college is going to be way harder it's going to be so different um, and i'm here to kind of say you know yes it's going to be a, a different mindset you're going to need different skills and techniques um, you're going to need enhanced organization but it's not this big scary thing um, definitely you know Folks have been doing it for years and years, and the Academic Success Center especially is here to act as that campus hub for undergraduate student learning and success, and is a connection point for you as uh, new incoming students to really you know, hone those skills that are gonna allow you uh, to make this transition to college smooth. Um, you also notice that one of the things that I, I put there that's kind of different about college as opposed to high school is this idea of independence. Um, and if independence, to be honest with you, can be sometimes a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, it's very exciting to come into a new environment, into college and kind of be on your own, maybe for the first time. Um, but also, you know, it takes, it takes that organization, it takes self-motivation um, to do those pieces. So, if you would, um, throw in the chat if you have ever heard something like what's on the left here of the screen, you know, I'm, or, or even if you've ever said uh, one of these things yourself, I'm just, I'm not good at math or I can't write papers. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to do science because I just don't get it. Anybody ever heard anything like that? All right, looks like, okay, cool. Somebody said they've, yeah, they're terrible at English, yeah. Definitely math. Okay, it sounds like a lot of a lot of folks have either said these things about themselves, heard other people, you know, saying them. Well, I'm here to tell you that's something that we call a fixed mindset. Um, and what we're hopefully trying to cultivate um, is something called a growth mindset. So, you know, especially any of you folks who said that I'm bad at, at writing papers, I, you know, I'm terrible at English. Here's what I'm, I'm here to tell you as a former uh, writing, writing center tutor myself, you're gonna be fine. Everyone has a capability of writing a good paper. Everyone has a capability of improving their math skills. Um, one of the things that's gonna be important to really think about and, and cultivate in yourself is this ability to really think about it in the way of you can make those improvements. Um, it takes work, it takes practice, it takes dedication. Um, but if you go into things with that mindset, um, you can really kind of see how improving your skills in all of these areas is doable, one, um, and two, that's what's going to really allow you to be successful and to thrive in this college environment. So, food for thought.
Now, one of the other things too to think about and, and a piece that kind of connects in with this idea of a growth versus fixed mindset is our understanding of how we interact with information. And this is gonna be a key difference between you know, high school and college. Um, in high school, for, for many of you, and, and maybe some of you went to high schools where this wasn't, wasn't always the case, but you know, middle school, high school, it's a lot of being told information and being expected to kind of get that information back. So it's, you know, if we're looking at this um, il illustration here, which is called Bloom's Taxonomy, it's a lot of remembering and understanding information, not necessarily being expected to apply or analyze. But now that you're in college, the way that we're going to ask you to engage in that information is going to be a little bit different. So you are going to be expected to do that application and to do that analysis. But the beauty of the what we know about how we know is that we know applying and analyzing really depends on a strong foundation of understanding and remembering. So as you're moving forward into your classes, as you're kind of digging in, it's important to keep coming back to that knowledge base and keep filling in those details so you have a really strong foundation on which to then kind of move up this pyramid. Because um, I'm sure you know, you can't, you can't understand something that you don't remember. And it's really hard to apply something that you don't understand. Has anyone ever heard of the curve of forgetting? I'm gonna take the lack of chat activity to mean no. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Thank you, thank you, Aaron M. Well, the curve of forgetting is another piece of this how we know what we know. And this is gonna be something that, to be honest with you, I find it really helpful uh, when I'm working with, okay, how do I be successful in something that I'm being tested on? How do I be successful in something that I need to remember on a long-term basis? And the, the underpinning essentially of this theory is all about memory. Um, and as you remember from the previous slide, hopefully, uh, remembering is kind of the core piece of one of the first foundations of how we engage with information. So the curve of forgetting gives us a theoretical basis to kind of build a study plan around. What you can kind of see here is this illustration of black line is kind of your memory. If you went to class and took, took fantastic notes, you paid attention to every single word, your understanding of the material and your, you know, the the material that went into your mind was at 100% and then you walked away from class and you didn't touch any of that information again. As you can see, about 10, you know, uh, 24 hours later, you know, this day two, you're already down at about 50%, lower even of the information that you retained from that class. You get out to day seven, that's even less. And you get, get out to day 30 when you might be taking a final exam or you may be taking you know, some other kind of test on that information. And it's um, concerningly low. Uh, I can't say that I've ever done very well on a test uh, where my retention of the information has been quite as low as this black line that's um, on the curve of forgetting. Ah, but what is the yellow line? The yellow line is if you take the time to review and study information. And you can see the, the times um, at the top there, that's really the time that it would take for you to get back up to where the, you know, the curve is. So as you can see, day two, you spend 10 minutes in a review, you know, it gets back up to that 100%. And so the idea of this is when we study frequently and spaced out and we practice that retrieval of information, we can move information from our short-term short memory that has a really steep drop-off period to being information that's in our long-term memory that we can reliably go back 
in and kind of access when we need it for a test, for a quiz, anything like that. So how do we actually put the curve of forgetting into practice? Important thing for all of us to know. We put it in, in the ASC, we put it in something called the study cycle. Um, and this looks like a lot. And I, I don't necessarily want to go over every single piece of this with you today. I do just want to hit these kind of three really important pieces because I think that's what all, you know, 49, 51 of you um, are going to want to walk away from this uh, really, really knowing and really practicing as you go into these first few weeks of classes. The first step in the study cycle is going to be a preview. Um, this one is hugely, in, you know, hugely important, not the most important, but it gives you a leg up um, when you're thinking about, you know, the curve of forgetting, you're thinking about how that, you know, memory goes. If you preview before class, it's going to give you just a little bit of that extra kind of ability to retain that information and also the ability when you actually attend class to really be clued into what's happening. Um, it's like if, if you've ever studied a foreign language um, and you know you hear a, a native speaker speaking and, and it seems like they're going really really quickly uh, and then you learn some words from that language and then it starts to, starts to feel like okay now I, now it's a little slower now I can really you know pick out some individual words. Previewing before class is going to be kind of similar to that. Just get eyes on that material. And it doesn't have to be anything more intense than, you know, showing up five minutes early, uh, logging into a Zoom lecture five minutes early and flipping through a chapter um, kind of before class gets started. Part two of the study cycle, attending class. A novel idea. Um, and I'm sure all of you will attend every class uh, session that you have. I'm sure. Uh, but no, seriously, going to class is one of the hugely important pieces of this because it's not just about being physically in that class. Um, it's going to be also important to ask questions, take meaningful notes. If you saw something in the preview that you're like, I don't really understand what this is, or I know I'm going to have trouble with this concept because I, you know, I know that I can improve my math skills with practice, but right now I don't feel so secure and, and you know, confident about it that's going to be the time that you have access to those professors to make sure that you're filling in those those pieces now review is arguably um i mean if attend is the most important review is maybe arguably the second most important of these three that we're going to go over this is where that study cycle really uh or the study cycle really connects back to the curve of forgetting we would recommend within the 24-hour period read over your notes. Um, to me, I think this doesn't necessarily have to be more than 10 to 15 minutes of just reorient yourself, remind yourself what you talked about, fill in any gaps, um, note, note down any questions that you have for the next um, class period. And when I say fill in gaps, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a handwritten note kind of person and my handwriting sometimes leaves a little to be desired. Um, and so for me, this always looks like, okay, I'm going to go in and I know what that word means now because it's been 24 hours uh, or within that 24 hours. But if I wait any longer, that's my handwriting and I may not recognize that word later. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, you know, rewrite that piece. Or maybe I skipped a whole line because the professor was kind of moving kind of quickly. Okay, well, I'll go into the book and I'll fill in that gap for myself so that I know that I have that information when I want to go back and actually look at it later. Now, the last two pieces of the study cycle, um, studying, this seems pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory that study might be a, a piece of the study cycle, and then assess. Um, and these two are also very important. The studying is going to be a continuation of, of kind of following along with that um, curve of forgetting and the assess is going to be pretty important to do that practice of retrieval to really put yourself into the situation of taking a test so that you know what that feels like and you're, it's not so um, different when you sit down to actually take it and again any if there are any questions about anything that i've gone over or anything that you want me to go into more 
in depth about, anything that you wish that I would kind of cover that I haven't yet, go ahead and throw that, you know, in the chat. Um, and so, so I know kind of where, where folks are at. Now, um, a piece that I think is really going to be important for all of you, tips for online learning. Um, I do want to make sure, um, ooh, we have a question about Cornell notes. Yeah, if that's going to be um, uh, something that, that works for you. I think Cornell notes can be really useful because it gives you an opportunity to do that preview and then know that you are kind of taking notes that work for you and then reviewing those later to kind of, you know, put them in a form that's going to work. I think that's that's perfect. So, um, you know, something that again that all of you may be pretty interested in is these tips for online learning. First off, one thing that I am going to um, really highly recommend is familiarize yourself with the technology you're going to be using, even if you're going to be going back, you know, to to the hybrid, partially in person, um, for the rest of the semester after, you know we go back, um, really, really encourage you, look into Canvas. Know where everything is for your classes. Really familiarize yourself with using that um, so that it's not the, the class period that you're logging on or when you're doing a quiz or a, a piece of homework isn't the first time that you're logging into Canvas. This is kind of a practical tip. Um, another <laughs> practical tip, be really aware of what's expected of you and we'll go kind of further in depth with um, each of these other points uh, as we go in this presentation. Know your preferred organizational methods and then really stick to those. Um, Time-based versus task-based, this is one of those no wrong answers, but you got to know yourself uh, and then you can refine those techniques into something that's really going to work best for you. And then find your balance. Um, how much time is too little time studying and how much time is maybe too much time. So uh, we have a, a resource that I think is really useful for knowing what's expected of you. Um, it's right on our website. And if any of you want to you know, email me or what have you, I can also send it directly to you. Um, so rules of the game is a way for you to organize all of the information from your classes and all of the syllabi in one easy to Really useful because then instead of flipping through a bunch of syllabi, you can just look to this and say, ah, okay, you know, for all of my courses, these are when the exams are. And so then you can start to really think about like, okay, well, I have two exams in the same day. When am I going to study for both of those? Um, it's just very, it's, it's helpful to have everything where you don't have to shuffle through a bunch of papers or a bunch of windows. Um, you can have it just in a nice sheet. Throw in the chat, um, what, what do you guys think? Are you time-based or are you task-based? Um, when I say time-based, I mean, you know, you set hard deadlines, you know every minute of every day what you need to be doing, um, or you set things up really chronologically. Uh, and by task-based, I really mean, you know, are you more of a to-do list person? Do you set yourself out with these are the tasks that I want to complete, um, and then go forth with those? bit of both. I like that answer. I'm also a bit of both. Very cool. Very cool. I think it's a, it's a good mix of task versus time versus both. Well, let's get a little bit deeper into some of the resources that we have to maybe help out um, with these pieces. So first for a time base is going to be weekly planner. Um, again, this is on our website. We can send you any of this information. Um, you know, you can, you can put in the information. I really encourage you to first put in your non-negotiables. And I don't just mean your class times and your lab times, though that is a big piece of what I mean by that. Um, so input, you know, when you have uh, chem lab input when you have english class but also input breakfast lunch dinner times input you know anything that you consider a non-negotiable put that on this list and then you can go from non-negotiables to negotiables i'd recommend color coding your planner 
um, I'd recommend color coding also uh, based on for you guys specifically um, I'd recommend color coding when you need to be live in class and when you need to be online in class that that you know for anybody who's a little bit more visual that might help you kind of keep those things in line this gives you a nice overview of what each week looks like and that's what i mean by non-negotiables so where have you promised your time and then what are, what is your time what are the things that are important to you that you can kind of filter in to the times that you've already dedicated to something else so for you guys you know non-negotiables might look like clubs and organizations that you're a part of it might look like going to the gym. That's not my non-negotiable, but if it's yours, put it on the weekly planner. Um, and then color code things in a way that makes sense. You can color code by non-negotiables and negotiables. You can color code, you know, in different ways. And like I said, yeah, you know, any anyone wants any of these resources, we can um, get them to you. I'll be honest, they're super helpful for me at least now this is going to be more of that uh task-based organization method as well um, this is something called the four quadrant to-do list um, also known as covey's quadrants if you've ever heard of that now what i think is really interesting about this one um, and the reason why i kind of bring it up with folks who are more task-based is that it asks you to separate things on two x you know I was an English major in undergrad. Can you tell? I, I was one of those people who always said I'm not good at math. Uh, and it asks you to do that organization based on urgency and importance. Uh, and asks you to think through, okay, what things are going to be important and urgent? What things are going to be important but not so urgent? Like and stuff it's I up to you to actually do the yeah. organization and to like, figure out for yourself what that means um, yep. and what you'd like to complete um, based on how you've organized those things. So one of the important things to, you know, you may be thinking like, well, why wouldn't I always just do something that's important and urgent? Why wouldn't I, why would I put something on this list that, you know, isn't urgent? My best example is always, you know, you may have uh, discussion board posts that are due every single week. Every, yeah, you know, and those come up maybe, maybe even more times than just once a week. So those are going to be urgent. Those due dates are impending. But maybe that's worth like two points of your grade. Something that's not urgent might be that test that's two weeks away, but it's worth half of your grade. Pam, we lost you there for a second. We can't hear you. Oh. Sorry about that. Is that better? Can you can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? So I will get you the link to the weekly planner in just a moment. Okay. Kim, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you. I froze for a moment there. Um, where would you like me to, to pick back up? <laughs> I don't know how much you missed or... I think you were giving an example of something that was important and urgent maybe, or not urgent. Thank you, Erin. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, thinking through, you know, maybe this, the, a discussion board post that comes up just regularly all the time, that's urgent and, you know, maybe it's worth two points of your grade. Something that's not so urgent is going to be that test that's due in two weeks, but that's worth half of your grade. So that's maybe more important. Um, so really, you know, thinking through how do you define those things for yourself? And then what does that mean about how you manage your time? Um, I mean, ideally, you're going to clear all of the boxes, but it's really up to you as to what you do first um, and how you give yourself enough time to get through all of those tasks. 
And again, that's just one example of a to-do list. We have some other options that aren't necessarily like this, but if this works for you, if this is of interest, you know, give it a try. So, this is uh, our social medias. That's kind of the, the end there of, of my spiel. Um, the Academic Success Center, like I said earlier, is that kind of hub for student learning. So if you want to come talk to Brittany and I about academic coaching, if you want to talk about organization, if you need somebody to chat with about how do I stay organized with online classes, um, we're more than happy to, to chat with you and kind of help you out with that. But also the Academic Success Center itself has, you know, course support programs, tutoring, how things like that, and other opportunities like this to tune into um, different workshops uh, and things. So definitely check us out. Stay aware of, of kind of what we've got going on. So we've got a few minutes left. Um, if anyone has any other you know, questions, we are dropping the uh, resources that we talked about today in the chat. So be sure to download those before you hop off of the call because um, the chat will, will go away once you do so. Um, but yeah, uh, again, thank you all so much for, for coming and, and tuning in. Uh, we're really excited to have you here at Clemson and to welcome you on this new adventure. <laughs>